Welcome back, guys. It's time for lesson 27. We're going to be talking about scattering, both classical and quantum mechanical, and a little more on the ion trap homework. So why is scattering interesting? Well, basically, almost everything we know about the microscopic world, uh, atomic and subatomic world, has been learned uh, more or less through some kind of scattering experiment from Rutherford's uh, alpha particle experiment on gold foil that enabled him to deduce the existence of the nucleus to uh, the Large Hadron Collider, which is probably the most famous current example of a, of a scattering system. Um, so scattering is an important process for understanding physics, I guess is what it boils down to, at least at the, uh, at the microscopic level. And uh, there's both the classical point of view and a quantum mechanical point of view, and they're related to one another in a, in a very basic way. So let's, let's go ahead and talk about the classical situation. You imagine you have some kind of a target and a particle that is uh, interacting with the target along some classical trajectory. And uh, we define the uh, cross-section, the differential uh, cross-section d sigma, actually that's not, let's just call it d sigma, the differential cross-section we'll get to in a moment, and uh, it corresponds to a certain impact parameter called b, and for every particle that comes in with a certain impact parameter, it's going gonna, it's gonna to leave with a certain angle theta. Let's say if b is between b and b plus db, then theta is going to be between theta and theta plus d theta. Now one thing is that as b gets bigger, theta usually gets smaller. That is, small impact parameters produce large values of theta, and large impact parameters produce small values of theta. Um, <coughs> there may be some impact parameter uh, beyond which uh, you get no scattering at all. That would be sort of the, the maximum extent of the interaction. And uh, for every Ang for every differential change in theta, there's a corresponding solid angle, d omega. And one thing that we're going to be interested in is the ratio of d sigma, the incoming uh, transverse cross-section that the, that the incoming particle sees, divided by d omega, the solid angle into which that particle is scattered. That is actually called the differential cross-section. The total cross-section is the integral of all the d sigmas for which there is any scattering at all. And uh, of course we can replace d sigma with d sigma d omega, do a change of variables, and integrate over d omega. Uh, d omega uh, is a differential solid angle. Um, now here's the thing. If you look at the geometry, d sigma, if I, if I integrate over all possible values of phi, d sigma is 2 pi b db. It's the circumference of the circle times the thickness of the little band. And uh, d, o, d omega, on the other hand, is 2 pi sine theta d theta. That's the definition. Well, that's one way to look at the definition of a solid angle. And uh, you can see, if you simply take the ratio of those two things, that d sigma d omega is simply b divided by the sine of theta times the absolute value of db d theta. Now, it's absolute value only because, as I said, as b gets bigger, theta gets smaller, so the derivative db d theta is typically a negative number, but uh, we want to think in absolute terms, uh, so d sigma d omega is usually positive, so we take the absolute value. That's the idea. So how can we use that? Let's, uh, let's take a classical case. That would be, for example, Rutherford backscattering. Now, there's a relationship in Rutherford backscattering. It's basically an incoming charged particle interacting with a stationary charged particle, or you could think of it that way, uh, between the impact parameter b and the angle theta. Now, deriving this formula turns out to be hard. It's just classical physics. It's, uh, you know, dynamics or whatever. But uh, it's, it's non-trivial. I can't do it in five minutes. But uh, you can look it up, or you can convince yourself that it's OK. One thing we can do, though, is to, given this relationship between b and theta, um, we can get the corresponding differential cross-section, which is uh, d sigma d omega. And using the formula that we have at the top of the screen there, and we'll probably try and do that as board work today if we have time. And so uh, you can look forward to that. And uh, let's talk about uh, the quantum mechanical version of scattering. So the idea here is 
uh, we did this actually last semester in one dimension. We had an incoming wave with a unit amplitude. There was some reflected wave with an amplitude B and a transmitted wave with an amplitude C. And the way we worked out the values of B and C was we had to solve the Schrodinger equation for the region of the uh, x-axis, I guess, where the potential was non-zero. So the, the psi L is the potential to the left of where the potential is uh, non-zero, and psi R is the wave function to the right of the, that region where the potential is non-zero. And where the potential is actually non-zero, then we had to cook up different wave functions. And then we had to match up the slope and the value of the wave function at the boundaries of the potential to make sure that everything uh, correctly solved both the Schrodinger equation and satisfied the necessary boundary conditions. And, and that's the way we worked out B and C. Uh, if you don't remember how any of that went, I've got a little demo here. I'll just show you. Maybe it'll ring a bell for you. All right, you guys no doubt remember Computing Project 7 from last semester. We had a, uh, a potential that was a square barrier, basically, and a wave packet that was projected toward the potential, and we used the Fourier transform uh, to switch back and forth between momentum space and real space in order to evolve the wave function in time. And uh, so let's run that guy so it all comes back to you. There we have our wave packet coming in. Here I'm going to graph the probability of being on the left side of the barrier and being on the right side of the barrier as a function of time, and we'll let the thing go. You can kind of see there's interference at the barrier, but once the wave packet evolves to a point where it either is transmitted or reflected, you can see there's some probability of being transmitted, some probability of being reflected that are also shown here in the graph. And that's more or less the way the thing works. Now, how do we extend this to three dimensions? So the idea is we have an incoming wave now that's moving along the z-axis, but what's the outgoing wave going to look like? Well, I propose it's going to look something like this. It's going to have an e to the i k r. R is the r, the r direction relative to the, the potential. And uh, for the moment, we can imagine a spherically symmetric potential where um, r is uh, simply the distance from the origin. And uh, notice that there's a 1 over r here. That reflects the fact that as the wave function emanates or it spreads out from the uh, origin, its amplitude has to diminish in order to conserve probability. If we had a uh, amplitude that remained th the same in magnitude as the thing as the wave spread out, then the total probability would be increasing with time, with time because uh, you could uh, integrate over all uh, r and you'd get a inf you know a big number. So in order to keep the probability from growing. Uh, as you get to larger and larger values of r, the amplitude has to go down like 1 over r. Another way to think about that is the area through which the uh, wave function is, tr is passing goes like r squared. The probability is going to go like the amplitude squared. And the product of those two, if you take the product of the amplitude squared times the area, uh, you've got to get something that stays finite. And so that, that recipe demands that the... Uh, that the amplitude go down like 1 over r. And f of theta is simply reflecting the fact that the uh, number of particles scattered at different angles is going to vary, and so the amplitude has to vary with theta. And that actually that function has a name. It's called the scattering amplitude. But what is it, really? Well, let's think about it. If we have a wave function that looks something like this, um, let's calculate the probability of a particle passing through a certain uh, region with an area d sigma with a certain velocity v. The, uh, the volume of a, if you wait for a time dt, the volume in which the particle has to be is v dt d sigma. That's a, v dt is a distance and d sigma is an area, so v dt d sigma is a volume. You multiply that volume by the wave function amplitude squared and you get a probability. But that same particle has to pass through a solid angle, uh, d sigma, or through a corresponding area, dA, um, which is v dt dA, and then uh, multi yeah, that has to get multiplied by the amplitude of the wave function squared. Um, but notice that that's going to go like f of theta squared over r squared. But what is dA? 
Well, d, sig d omega, excuse me, is defined as dA over r squared. That's a different way, but it's an equivalent way to define solid angle. It's the area divided by the distance to the origin squared. Um, and so I can solve for dA as r squared d, d omega. I can put the r squared d omega back into the uh, formula for probability, and I, I can insist that these two probabilities have to match. So that, that means that uh, f squared over r squared, r squared d omega, has to be the same thing as d sigma. And if you follow that through, you'll see that d sigma d omega is nothing other than the magnitude of the scattering amplitude squared. So, in fact, if we can solve for the scattering amplitude, then we can get d sigma d omega. How do we get the scattering amplitude? Well, just like in the one-dimensional case, we have to solve the Schrodinger equation for the region in which the potential is non-zero. And uh, we're going to get into the details of how to actually do that next time. But, uh, but that's the basic idea. You use the Schrodinger equation where the potential is non-zero to get the scattering amplitude. And once you have the scattering amplitude, you've got the differential cross-section. And uh, finally, what I want to do is touch on some of that ion trap homework we started last time. Uh, in class, we, we worked out a couple of the problems dealing with the equilibrium position of the ions and the frequency of the uh, common center of mass mode and the frequency of the breathing mode. We did all that in class last time, but uh, we didn't get to the cooling business. So I wanted to remind you a little about the cooling business. There's the solution to the um, time evolution of the ions position under the uh, both the trapping potential plus the um, plus the laser cooling force. There's the uh, two aspects to the cooling force. There was the radiation pressure and there was the damping. Okay, um, I want to remind you that the the force for the damping and the radiation pressure ended up looking something like this, and it had this function n of omega, which was the spontaneous emission rate of the atom in uh, at a frequency, omega sub L, the laser frequency. Um, if you look at that, you'll see that the time constant for decay, the damping time constant, is nothing other than 2m over gamma. So if we know little lowercase gamma, we can work out, and we know the mass of the ion, then we can work out the damping time constant. That's one of the things we wanted to know. Also, if we can figure out what the uh, radiation pressure force, F naught, is on the average, um, and we know the frequency of the trap, then we can figure out the uh, displacement of the ion from its equilibrium position at, you know, when, when the cooling laser is on full. Now, F naught, as you can see looking at the expression for F average, is uh, just related to the uh, line function N, evaluated at omega sub L, and uh, lowercase gamma is related to the derivative of the line function times some other stuff. So, uh, so in fact, you can see that it's the derivative of the line function times h bar omega squared over c squared, evaluated at the laser frequency. And you can see that f naught is the value of the line shape function evaluated at the laser frequency times the momentum of a single photon. That's kind of how the thing turns out. Now, if you remember, the line shape function has a width, uh, I'm going to distinguish it here as uppercase gamma, and it's resonant at a frequency omega zero. And if you put all that in, um, and also put in the fact that the laser frequency is just a little bit below the resonant frequency by a, an amount gamma over, over 2, excuse me. If you plug that back into the line shape function, take the derivative of the line shape function and plug in the laser frequency, you get these results that the, uh, the line shape function is half its maximum value and the derivative is its maximum value divided by the line width. Ga uh, uppercase gamma, which, by the way, is just 1 over the lifetime of that state. So the remember, the cooling states were a strong dipole transition, so the lifetime is going to be on the order of nanoseconds. So that means that uh, gamma, uppercase gamma, is going to be something like gigahertz. And uh, so that means n prime is going to be n naught divided by something like gigahertz. That'll give you an idea of what the, what the value is. Anyway, 
uh, you can plug in numbers here and get an actual value for lowercase gamma, the damping rate, and you can plug in numbers again and get the value for uh, the uh, radiation pressure force um, in terms of the laser frequency and the line shape maximum. And that's kind of the idea. So go ahead and, and use those parameters. I think if I remember correctly, I had said that N0 over 2 was going to be something like 10 to the 6 transitions per second. And, uh, and if you assume that uh, uppercase gamma is something on the order of uh, uh, 10 to the 9 per second, something along those lines, then you should be able to work out these numbers and see how they, see how they go. All right, well, we'll talk to you guys next time.